at 6.30. Well, there's the other Mr. Jefferson. And Post. Well, good evening, everybody. We're going to look tonight at one of the very controversial passages of Scripture least in current Christianity, uh, for the past 150 years, this issue has been um, argued. Um, we're going to talk about first the millennium, and then secondly, we're going to talk about the judgment of God. <coughs> the um, church has been divided on this issue for a long time. Um, not just the past 150, it was just that it came out in 150 years and, uh, of recent times. But it, it goes way back, this issue of how to read the 20th chapter of Revelation. Uh, I'll tell you my view, and then I'll, I think I even marked there. I, oh, yes, I did. I said my view, maybe. Um, uh, so, um, but... There are certain things in the text that go beyond that debate. And I'm, when I have been asked to speak on this in various churches, um, I emphasize the thing that goes beyond debate, um, the, what I consider to be the important things. Now, if you remember my opening lecture, uh, some of us weren't here for that. <laughs> I wonder who that was. But uh, uh, I stated that what's important to me is not understanding all the little chronological things, not all the little interpretation things like who exactly is the beast, the Antichrist, and that. But my, the thing I want to know is what is the responsibility of a Christian when he faces such things as this? We may not face the Antichrist, but like John said, uh, he said, you've heard that Antichrist is coming, but I tell you there are many Antichrists now. So they had to face them back in the first century we have to face Antichrist today, and whatever that final one is, I don't want to see that. You know, maybe we are. I don't know. Some people are all excited right now saying Putin is the Antichrist. Well, he is an Antichrist, uh, at least in my thinking, he is an Antichrist. But uh, the Antichrist, don't know. Uh, we... We have all sorts of views as to what will that constitute. But I know this for certain. How am I, re how am I to respond to at least an Antichrist? Walk in late, I <laughs> call attention to it. <laughs> okay, but anyway, uh, so tonight we're going to look at the millennial issue and the judgment issue, and the judgment one isn't hard to do. Uh, it's actually, I think, relatively easy uh, in that, but the millennial thing is difficult. And so what is it? We'll see, and we'll talk about this in a second. But um, I want to have a word of prayer, and not just for us, but for the... Ukrainians and the Russians who don't want to be in this thing. You know, there are plenty of Russians who do not want to be in this, and um, I want to pray for both of those because they are facing something that's very evil right now. And let's just have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for our lives. We pray that we would be dedicated to you and to your kingdom. We thank you, God, that Christ has translated us from the domain of darkness and into the, his 
great kingdom. Uh, we thank you that scripture teaches this. We pray, Father, that we will see that great day when the kingdom comes in its fullness and its completeness, that we'll see the new heavens and new earth, and that we will rejoice on those days. Father, this day we offer prayers for the Ukrainian people and the Russian people who do not want this war that's going on right now. We pray, Father, that you will deal with those who are responsible, and you will deal with them in your way and in your time, but you, you will deal with them. Uh, we pray, Father, that as far as lies within us, that we would be peacemakers, that the Christians um, in the Soviet Union would be among those who seek for peace. We pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, amen. The 20th chapter of Revelation. As I said, this is a tough passage. Um, people say, well, you just have never studied the other uh, thinking. And I'm there, no, I've actually thought about all of these things. And um, I see why people believe what they do. Now, what in the world are we dealing with? Well, we're dealing, um, first of all tonight, with the millennium. Mille is 1,000 in Latin. Anum is years, the thousand years, and that's what the text is about, um, where the Satan is bound for a thousand years. Okay? Now, one of the first questions that we'll not talk much about but look at is, is this literal thousand years or is this a figurative thing? Um, doesn't much matter to me. Um, if it's literal, it's literal. If it's figurative, it's figurative. It's, that's how I look at it. But if you look at numbers in the book of Revelation, there's a quote-unquote symmetry to them. Uh, usually, Satan's power is pictured as a short time. His time is short. You'll see that type of thing. Or seven years or three and a half years for 42 months or, you know, you just go down the line. A very short time. But what is interesting in this text is that Satan is bound for a big period of time, which is a way of saying God is the true victor in this cosmic battle that is going on. Okay, so we will first look at the millennium from the perspective of Satan, but then we'll look at the millennium from the perspective of the saints. I hopefully didn't put Satan in. No, I didn't. Sometimes you type one word, and then the next line you're going to type it again. You type the same thing. The saints... Uh, reign for a thousand years. Okay, that's two parts to the passage. Then we'll look at the final battle, and then we will look at the final judgment. Okay, now what's exciting to me is finally I get out of this struggle this week, and next week we will look at the great victory that God is promising. And um, we have two chapters on the new heavens and new earth. People don't disagree about that part of the book as much as they do about this part of the book. Okay, this is, this is a, a quote-unquote a deadly battle. Well, anyway, um, if we look at the millennium, first of all, uh, it is a theological debate. Okay. Uh, if you look at it, I, if you look at my outline, I say the millennium. Satan is imprisoned for a thousand years. Well, let's look at... Um, the opening few verses, three verses. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss, shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Okay, that's all it says about Satan in this period of time. Now, the big question to a lot of people, not necessarily to me, but to a lot of people, is this question of the relationship of chapter 19 and chapter 20. Now, you have what is called, um, well, we have what we call millennial views, the thousand-year views. 
Okay, premillennialism is a view that says you have the church age, then you have a time of great trouble, okay, um, which we will, in our popular culture, we call the tribulation, okay, it's, um, even though technically the word, uh, we all live in tribulation because in John chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, Revelation of John chapter 1. Um, verse 9, John says, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in what? What are we partakers in? Now, this is in the 90s, 90 AD, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, people... We we're not quite sure exactly when he wrote it, but in the 90s, it's like 60 years after Jesus started his ministry, and 50, 60 years after his death. Now, we'll notice what John says he is in. I am your brother and fellow partaker in the, not just a tribulation or just tribulation, the tribulation. Okay, we are in the tribulation. Um, what these people mean is that there's an intensifi intensification of this trouble at, at the end. Uh, sometime, and I don't have time to do this, if I had weeks and weeks and weeks left, we could do this, but uh, go back through church history sometime. Get a church book, book on church history and read what pe people suffered. And I'll, I'll recommend a book you can get on the internet, free. Just look up uh, Martyrdom of Polycarp. Uh, talks about how he was martyred. Well, Christians, if you, you look at it, we have suffered horribly at the hands of the world. Paul talks about being thrown to the dogs. What's that mean? Well, dogs sometimes means just evil men. Like Paul says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers so on and so forth. But a dog, thrown to the dogs in the Roman Empire is they would skin an animal, probably one they were going to sell in the meat market, but take that bloody skin, wrap it around a guy, and hobble him to some degree or just let him free. It didn't much matter. And they would release hungry dogs on this guy. Well, the dogs would smell the blood and they would chase this guy, and if they caught him, they'd kill him. Well, Paul was thrown to the dogs on multiple occasions, according to him. Um, Christians were beheaded. Christians were thrown into the lions with the lions in the Roman Empire. Um, all sorts of horrifying things. And even today, Christians in certain countries are being brutalized. Okay? So if the tribulation, this... If you look on that chart, um, the great, I think that says trib, but I, I, I can't read the little chart I got. Um, the great tribulation, that if it is worse than what we have seen, I don't want to see it, okay? Now, um, so they have a great tribulation. Now, some of them say that the Christians are taken out of the world before the tribulation starts, okay? That's the... Um, um, they're sorry, right? <laughs> Were you here the night I told what I do to my student would do to my students if their phones went off? Uh, I, I would say, hand me the phone, and I'd answer it and say, "Joe's Bar and Grill." Joe speaking. <laughs> I, I, okay, okay. Well, anyway, uh, some say all oh, the Christians won't go through the tribulation. That's why they've got an arrow at the beginning uh, called the rapture. And then there's a second arrow. That some say, no, it's halfway through the tribulation. And then others say, no, it's at the end of the tribulation. That's a big debate among the premillennialists. But what their, their big thing is that they say after the second coming of Jesus, there is a thousand years of peace on earth. Okay, the 
big assumption is that chronologically, Revelation 20 follows Revelation 19. Okay. That's one of the views. Now, there are two variations of that, but not much difference in some ways. In other ways, there's a lot of difference. So that's basically premillennialism. Now, notice they say after the millennium comes the new heavens and new earth. Everybody agrees with that. Then there is what you call ah mill. Now, premillennialism means Jesus comes before the millennium. Ah mill is a bad term. If you look down below, I put an alternate term they prefer. Ah mill means there's no millennium. Well, there is. Revelation says there is, you know, so that's a bad description. But what they call it is realized millennialism. These guys believe that the millennium takes place in the heavenly realm. The millennium is going on right now. It's just a symbolic term for whatever. And it's about Christ's reign in the heavenly realm. And uh, if you read the 12th chapter of, of Hebrews, the Jerusalem of the, his kingdom is in the heavenly. We, we have come to the heavenly Jerusalem, you know, the city of God. So Amil has also a great tribulation. But they have the quote-unquote rapture at the end of it, okay? And then they have new heavens and new earth, okay? This is something uh, you can probably find people espousing each of these views. I'm going to get past this controversy. I promise not to belabor the thing. Then you have post-mill. Um, this one is not very popular these days. I am a post-millennialist, <laughs> maybe. Okay. Now, what does that believe? Well, this one says, and uh, those of you who know, uh, knew of Dr. Foster at Cincinnati Christian University, Lewis Foster, Lewis Foster was one of these. And of the teachers there, the, I've only known the three of their teachers were post-mill, me, Mr. Lloyd, and, my, and uh, Lewis Foster. But I'm not going to push this because I could change my mind, okay? Um, especially when whatever the millennium is happens. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what do you believe? What just happened? See, that, that's it. That's just what, you know, whatever the millennium is. So, but post-millennialism believes that the millennium is the second half of the church age. And um, at least the, what he what Foster called the uh, late millennialism. I like that term better. Jesus comes post after the millennium. But what it is, is there are two parts to the church age. There's the church militant, meaning we are fighting a spiritual war not against flesh and blood, but that there comes a point where God says, okay, we will bind Satan. And the church is triumphant. There is a great victory of the church. Okay. I know the problems with that view, but I like that view. Uh, a lot of famous people were post-millennial. For example, in our group, a guy named Alexander Campbell, he was a post-millennialist. Okay. A lot of those early guys in our group were. What put an end to post-millennialism, Campbell wrote a uh, thing called the Millennial Harbinger. He thought the Millennium, because he was having such great success with his evangelism, he thought, oh, the, this devil's been bound. We're, we're having great success, and, you know, we're going to have the Millennium now. And um, so he thought the Millennium was about to emerge upon us, and so he wrote this thing called the Millennial Harbinger, okay? What put an end to, at least for a time, it's coming back, not as quickly as I'd like, but what put an end to this was World War I and World War II. Oh, my. Oh, my. Okay. World War I and World War II were horrifying moments. And especially World War II when the United States dropped those two nuclear devices on Japan. We have almost, uh, and that's what our people are afraid of today because Putin claims he could have his finger on the, the button. I hope not. Um, but we will wait and see. 
Uh, this is why we take our refuge in Christ Jesus. If I die, I die. A guy asked me last week, what happens if, you know, Cincinnati gets hit? You know, Cincinnati's a prime target. You've got the GE fighter jet engine plant. Great, why doesn't GE move? <laughs> but what happens then? Do, we, do you leave? Well, if it catches us by surprise and we survive, you know, the blast, what do we do? We act as Christians. That's what we do. We act as Christians. That's, that's the only alternative. So, um, these guys have the great tribulation happening, except they're going to do something with the tribulation that the pre-mills won't do and uh, the ah-mills will do. They, those two will do this. So that's a quick survey. You can look at the charts, and if you're interested, you can go and find, just Google. I'm assuming you know how to Google. Uh, what, a, what a great thing for controversy. Google premillennialism. Google postmillennialism. Google amillennialism. And find someone who's in favor of it and read them. I, I read, for example, the views I don't believe. I read the best proponent of that view. Why should I ask the Reverend Billy Bob Bodine from Frog Holler, Kentucky, what his view is? That's a joke among theologians. So. Um, I, I, I don't ask that. I'll, ask a guy, I'll, I'll listen to a guy who's actually thought through his position. So that's something. Okay. Now... Um, Got to see where I did this. Okay, uh, if you notice, in all these um, views, there is a battle of Gog and Magog. Premillennialism has a battle of Gog and Magog. Amillennialism has a battle of Gog and Magog. And postmillennialism has a battle of Gog and Magog. Now, this is one of the top parts, but... Um, Those are the final battles. That is the final battle in everyone's view. But if you go through Revelation, it talks about the final battle on multiple occasions. I've come up with six passages that take us from John's day to the final battle. John's day to the final battle. John's day to the final battle. Now, the, the big question is the battle of Armageddon the same as the Battle of Gog and Magog. That's what people argue about. Now, this is why I would be either all-mill or post-mill, okay, because I think they're the same battle. Here's why. If you go through the book, just read the book, um, you've got six pictures of the final battle, the first one. The first is found in the seven seals. Uh, that, was, um, that started in chapter 6 when the seals were open. Um, but in the sixth seal of Revelation, a uh, sixth seal of the seven seals, this is the next last seal. Let's go back there. Chapter six, verses twelve through seventeen. I looked, and when he broke the sixth seal. Okay, now this is um, the Lamb. Jesus is breaking the seals. When he broke the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by the wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it was rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. That sounds like a end-of-the-world scene. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That, and I, if you remember back when I talked about that, that is so funny because we used to raise sheep and, oh, the wrath of the Lamb. Just think about it. A little lamb saved me from, oh, it's the Lamb. It's the lamb. Okay. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? See, but then the seventh seal will give you a picture of eternity. Silence in heaven for about the space of a half hour. God is able to call everything to silence. 
all that noise of battles and all that noise of screaming people, it stops for a half hour. And it's a picture, I think, of the beginning of eternity. Okay, so, uh, so we have a final battle, but then in the seven trumpets, when the seventh trumpet sounds, um, chapter 11, verses 15 through 19, then the seventh angel sounded, and there was, were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. No, notice it's not for a thousand years, it's just forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, and they, we have their thanksgiving. Verse 18, they, they say, And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged. So, we have them taking us a second time up to the final judgment. Okay, this, is a, this is a weird thing. He keeps doing what one guy called recapitulating. He tells the story, then tells the story again from a different perspective, then tells the story again from a different perspective, and then, but takes us always to this final battle. Okay, the, the third one is in chapter 14. Now, I'll just make a comment here. I'm not going to read that passage. But um, what w you need to see that this is starting all over again, chapter 12. Look at chapter 12. But in chapter 14, we're going to get to the, uh, in, uh, chapter 12. In chapter 14, we're going to get to the final battle. Uh, but chapter 12, what do we have? We have the birth of Christ. See, he goes back in time again and starts all over again, starts with the birth of the male child who is to rule the nations with the rod of iron. We've got his ascension and that type of thing. And then we got a fourth one in chapter 16. And then we've got a fifth one, which we saw last week, in chapter 19. See, he keeps talking about what is taking place, but he moves to, as I said, a different perspective. But he ends with final battle. So um, what I think, and a lot of people think, and could be wrong. If I had to be right, I wouldn't teach this at all. <laughs> but I try to do the best I can in understanding this. But in chapter 19, Jesus comes as Lord of lords and King of kings and wipes out the armies of the earth in some great battle, the battle of Armageddon, Armageddon. The, the mountain of Megiddo, that's what it means, and the great cosmic battle takes place, and he wins. Now, some think that 20 follows 19. That would be the premillennialists. The all-mill and the post-mill think, no, this is a retelling of the story. Now, I just take the idea that late in the church age, Satan is going to get a second, a second, a final restriction placed upon him, and he will not be able to operate. Now, I love verse 1 of this. In verse 1, it says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. Now, we think, people think, I know people, I'm just thinking of people I know that are Satan worshipers. They think he is a powerful being. He is compared to you. But you have to remember chapter 12 where it says, of the saint, the saint can overcome him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of his testimony, and by not loving his life even to the point of death. He may kill you, I don't mean to, or you, or the guys I'll kill, but the ladies don't get killed, okay? But uh, no, one of the tragedies are the women who get killed at the world oppressors and on the motivation of Satan. But 
But notice what it takes. Now, if you go read, you've got to read this book again yourself. Always look at the description of an angel. When an, an angel, one guy has his one foot on the land, one foot in the sea, and his head up in the clouds, and with a great voice says, time will be no more. Okay, very powerful image of an angel. Or a strong angel or whatever. Notice this angel. It doesn't have any description for him. Um, Ah, I put a list. No, I, I have a feeling I lost something here on the handout. I did. Ah, I hate computers at times. Okay. Um, there's not a word said about that. It's just an angel. An angel comes, and this is the big point I make, what's it take to take him down? It takes God's decree, but an angel to come with a chain and grab him and have the key to the abyss. It's not any special angel. It's just an angel in the description. That's such a powerful statement to me. This says to me, he's, Satan may be bad, but he's not as bad as he thinks he is. This is what it takes to bind him. And we're going to see one more thing on this, okay? Um, now, one of the things that the millennium shows to me is the unrepentant nature of Satan. Uh, I have a little chart here. Good night. Um, I covered this once before for you, but um, if you look at Satan, it's like he falls down a set of stair steps. Pump, 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 pump. Ever fall down stair steps? You know, each one hurts more than the last one. But in this set of stair steps he's falling down, there, it rise, there's like a lip on the steps. Todd looked at this and said, oh, I've seen this before or something like that, you know. I've seen, the, he had a class with me and I presented this, but... Uh, the, the idea is before he takes a downward step, a downward fall, he increases his activity. Okay, now people say, well, do you think he's doing that now? Well, maybe. You know, it could be the end of the world's coming. I don't know that it is. We'll see when it happens. But Satan's activity always increases before he takes a plunge downward. Now, where did Satan start out? Now, if you look at my, I have A, unfallen state, B, fallen state, uh, C, fallen state, church militant, D, fallen state, church triumphant, uh, ultimate state, hell. Now, that's where he's going. Now, we're, we're going to see hell tonight, but before we see hell, we see the millennium. Now, what happens in the millennium? Well, let's look at his downward plunge, his unfallen state. Ezekiel, if you can find Ezekiel. 28, beginning with verse 11. Okay. Okay. Now this handout I use for my students uh, made some changes to it, but um, in Ezekiel 28, 11, and the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up this lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God. Now, I have to explain that just for a second. The word lamentation, and I put it in both Hebrew characters and English characters, is kinah. Now, a kinah is a, a funeral dirge. Okay? Sometimes you make incomprehensible sounds in a funeral dirge. But if you look at funeral dirges in the Old Testament, they make comparisons. It's a comparison between someone in the present with someone in the past. Now, if the person in the past was an evil man, that means that someone in the present is just as evil. Okay? If the person in the past is a good man, 
then the person in the present is a good man. He's just as good. Okay, so this is a kina against the king of Tyre. It's a comparison. Now, who is uh, this guy being compared with? Okay, it doesn't say, but you can figure this out really easily. You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. Remember Genesis chapter 3, the Garden of Eden story. The Garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. And then he lists the stones. And by the way, they are priestly stones. Uh, priests wore these type of stones. So whoever this one was, he was, this being was, he was a thing. But look, verse 14 is the important one. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways. From the day you were created, he's a created being, okay, from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you, okay? Now, traditionally, Christians have understood this to be Satan. Who was Satan? He was a cherubim, one of the great cherubim. Five of them at one time, now four. Okay, he was, he was a cherubim. And he fell. But see, he had unlimited access to the heavenly realm. He could even walk in the presence of God, in the presence of God at times. Um, for example, in Daniel chapter 7, there's a flaming fire in the front of the presence of God at times. And he could walk in the midst of the flaming fire. Well, he's going to fire someday, but a different type. Um, but anyway, um, so that's his first state. But then he fell. In the Old Testament, we call, I call this the fallen state, the Old Testament, he has partial access to heaven, but not unlimited access. Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And the Satan, not just an adversary, but the Satan was among them. That's Job chapter 1. Job chapter 2, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And the Satan was, the Satan was among them to present himself. It's a slightly different change in the thing. But he had partial access to heaven. And God's going to ask him, where have you been? And he said, well, I've been roaming around on the earth, walking to and fro in it, you know, and that type of thing. So he has some access to the heavenly realm. I didn't put this verse down, but if you look in Zechariah 3, he can go to heaven and he can accuse a person. Okay. Well, then, if you go to Revelation 12, this is point C, the fallen state, the church militant. In Revelation 12, we looked at this. He's thrown out of heaven. Michael and his angels throw him out. He cannot go back there at all. See, he's taken a step down. But remember, it says, but woe to the earth, because he's come down with great rage. Okay. But it says they can overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and not loving their life even to the point of death. Okay, now, Revelation chapter 20, where is he? He's in the abyss. What's the abyss? Well, I have a list someplace on this sheet. Yep, his abode, the abyss. And that's every place in Scripture, mostly in Revelation, where the abyss is mentioned. It's someplace. But he's restricted. He's not even allowed on the earth during this period of time. He is restricted to the abyss. Great. Now, we, we want to skip ahead. No, I'm going to cover this one because I don't want to run out of time. Verse 10. Uh, and the devil who deceived them. This is after the battle of Gog and Magog and all that, the final battle. Uh, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay, They're going to get tortured forever and ever. Wow. And that's the strongest language in Scripture for hell. But notice only three beings receive that hell. The devil doesn't even list his angels. False prophet, 
and the beast. Now, I take the beast, I understand that to be politicians. Well, look at uh, Mr. Putin. What does he have to answer for? Now, here's how I understand judgment. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, but you get exactly what you deserve. No more, no less. If you study uh, divine justice, and especially in the Old Testament, you get punished for the crime that you did and for the consequences of it. I hate to use this illustration, but it's so painful to me and more painful to the victim. I know a young lady who was raped. She has nightmares about that moment. Not just a memory that occasionally hits up, but nightmares about it. And I think it's 20, 30 years ago. What's that guy have to pay for? What does he have to pay for? Just the act? Or does he have to pay for the consequences? Um, I'm going to pick on Dave tonight. I don't know why I like picking on Dave. I know he won't hurt me. <laughs> uh, but uh, I don't think he will. If Dave were, in the Old Testament, if Dave were my slave, I bought Dave for 30 shekels of silver. Every year he works for me, we take five shekels off. Five shekels is about a year's wage. Okay, We take five shekels off. Any of his family members, say Todd comes after two years and says, oh, Dan, I want to buy my dad. I'm going to say, are you sure? <laughs> he said, well, maybe. But uh, he said, I got 20 shekels. I have to sell Dave to Todd as a family member for the 20 shekels. No questions asked. Dave goes to Todd. Now, let's say I just bought D Dave today and tomorrow I poke out Dave's eye. I get mad at him. He doesn't know how to fix computers the way I want him to. And uh, I get mad at him, hit him, and poke out his eye. Do you know what happens? I have to release Dave that very day. No th 25, no 30 shekels, no 10 shekels, no 20 shekels, no shekels whatsoever. And I have to give him all sorts of goods. You can read Exodus and Deuteronomy on this subject. I have to give him stuff. See, you pay for what you have done and the consequences. So why do the devil, the false prophet, and the beast, if the beast is, I'll, I'll concede it might not be politicians, but sure sounds like politicians when you read those other things. Why do they get such a huge, it's not just they are tortured, they are tortured day and night, and I love this phrase. This is the most powerful way to say forever, unto the ages of the ages. Now, the word forever in Greek and Hebrew can mean for a real long time, but unto the ages of the ages. You go to the furthest age you can think of in the future, and then you go to its furthest age. That's how long these beings, and that's not used of the regular inhabitant of hell. Tortured. No ambiguity to that word whatsoever. Uh, let me state that again. No ambiguity to that word whatsoever. Wow. It means torture. Now, why do they deserve that? Misery that they have caused. You think of these false prophets. I'm, I won't say any names because the guy might repent and I don't want to. I'm hoping, I pray for some of these guys uh, that they repent. Because repentance, if they repent, God will forgive them. That's how powerful the sacrifice of Jesus is. But here's a guy who lives in a $10 million house. Another guy who fly, has, I think it's seven jets that he flies around. Jesus wants me to have a jet. 
let's sell at least six of those seven jets and feed the poor, you know, support a missionary, you know, pay a preacher. Just one of those things, you know. Um, so the suffering that these beings cause demands the justice of God. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a wound for a wound, a burn for a burn, a life for a life. That's why there's such strong language. Now, I, I, I don't want to overdo this, but uh, it's like Jesus told just the average guy, you need to flee from the wrath to come. You need to flee from that. Uh, you need to flee from the wrath to come. Can you imagine what these guys have to flee from? And Satan, he can read it the same as I can. He may have more questions than I do, maybe less, and he still rebels. No repentance, no change, no begging God for mercy. The beast and the false prophet, they surely know what they're doing is wrong. Surely know this. Okay, um, well, anyway, the devil falls down a set of stairs until he hits the ultimate state, which is hell. Amen. Now, we're done with that part. That's the hard part. If you look at the saints reigning, this is verses 4 through 6. I saw thrones, and they sat on them. Judgment was given to them. Judgment doesn't always mean judging like in a courtroom. Judgment can mean like in the days of the judges, a person who leads. Judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who is part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. If you look on the end of page two, um, who are these people that reign with Christ? Well, the, the first group are those that are beheaded. Now, why did he pick that one out? Because in John's day, beheading was something that only a Roman citizen would get. And the tradition is, and I don't doubt this tradition, that the Apostle Paul was beheaded. Okay. I saw one beheading on a, before it was taken down on the internet. And terrifying. But what a beheading was to a Roman citizen, you're a Roman citizen, you have every privilege you can imagine in the Roman Empire, and yet for the sake of Christ you are willing to give up that privilege, and they would behead you, okay? Uh, so th that to me was the ultimate act of devotion to Christ. Stretch out your neck and let the guy behead you. I saw another one on the internet. Muslims also practice beheading. There's a slightly different idea. Um, if your head is separated from your body, you the resurrection, you might not have a head. That's why they were all upset about Saddam Hussein because the Americans took his head. They knew what they were doing. And uh, But... I saw this video, I did, they didn't show the actual beheading, but this priest bowing down before them of his own free will because they were going to do it anyway, and them hooting and hollering and all that, sticking out his neck, sticking his head out, and testifying to them, I had to read the translations about his faith in Christ Jesus. Okay. So that's the first group, those who suffered great martyrdom. 
probably beheading was one type of martyrdom, thrown to the lions, another type, thrown to the dogs, another type, you know, crucifixion, another type, um, uh, putting a person, we have to be dramatic because this is real. This isn't, uh, we know the Romans did this. Nero supposedly took and put people on poles, covered them with tar, and lit them on fire to light his garden. And the person would thrash around in his pain and his agony. And people would, quote, unquote, enjoy that. Who else is going to reign with Christ? They did not worship the beast. They did not receive the mark of the beast. Um, they are people who are resurrected. Now, this one is a little tougher. Uh, this is one of the ones that said to me, I don't think this is something necessarily future, but go with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 5. This is a great text. Even if you're not going to study Revelation, you should study this text. John chapter 5, verse 25. John 5, 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, listen to this carefully, an hour is coming and now is. Do you get that? It's something that existed the time of Jesus. The hour is coming and now is when what? When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. You being dead in your trespasses and sins were made alive in Christ Jesus. Were buried with him in baptism and were raised with him to walk in newness of life. See, we have under, if we're Christians, we have undergone a resurrection of a type. Now, if you look at the other verse that I gave you, verse 28, notice, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming, but it doesn't say, and now is, in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did good deeds to the resurrection of life and those who committed evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. That's the final resurrection. That's when our bodies come out of the grave. But right now, we are resurrected. And many people link that verse with this idea in Revelation, um, the, the 25th verse, uh, with Revelation 20, verse 4, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, okay? And then they do the 28th verse of John 5, with the rest of the dead did not come out until the thousand years were completed. Okay, so... That's one way of looking at it, but, okay, uh, and they are priests of God. Well, that's something we already are, Revelation 1.8. He made us a kingdom of priests to his God. So, um, this is one of those things that's pictured as now and not yet. We suffer now, we suffer martyrdom, beheading, and other things. Um, we do not worship the beast or his image. We do not receive the mark of the beast. We are resurrected people, and we are priests of God. So that's who reign with Christ. Rather interesting concept. Don't know what that all entails. Okay, now let's go to page three of my handout. I've got six minutes here, and I think I can do this. Um, there's a final battle. I think this is the same as the one in chapter 19. Um, the armies of the earth are coming. Satan's released from his prison. The armies of the earth are rally around him, and they attack the people of God. They, they come to the broad plain of the earth. Um, physical Jerusalem is a bunch of hills. They come to the camp of the saints. Saints are everywhere. They surround the beloved city. Could mean Jerusalem itself, could mean the people of God. They come against the people of God, I'm not sure. We'll wait and see on that one. And uh, they lose. That's the final battle. Uh, verse 9, they came up on, up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. Fire came down from heaven and 
devoured them. They lose. Heaven saves us. Okay. Just like Jesus came in chapter 19, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and defeated the armies of the earth, uh, fire will destroy the armies of the earth. And we've read this verse already. The devil's going to, he doesn't even go to judgment day in this passage. He doesn't go to the great white throne. He just goes to hell. And some people uh, link this with the verse where Jesus said, the prince of this world is judged already. Gospel of John. Um, okay, so uh, then we go to the third part of this thing, the final judgment, the divine judge, uh, chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. I saw a great white throne. Now, one comment on a white throne. This is the only place in Scripture where the phrase white throne appears. What in the world? Why does he want to call it the white throne of God? It's a just judgment. White is a symbol of purity. This is a pure judgment. This isn't like uh, the judgments that we see in this world. Sometimes I, I, I watch a, a court case and... I'm there, man, I'm glad I did not have to decide that one. Or you watch one, you say, I think the guy was guilty, and he got off. Or you say the guy uh, was not guilty, and he didn't get off, you know, that type of thing. But this judgment is the great white throne, and it's a, a judgment of righteousness and truth, the God who knows everything. And listen to this. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, meaning everyone, standing before the throne, and the books were open. And what in the world are the books? One view is it's these ones. This, they're open. And another book was open, uh, whatever that one was. And he tells us what that one was, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, plural, I know what I'm going to be judged on according to their deeds. Now, notice we're, we're punished according to our deeds, and that's just the idea of you get what you deserve. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a wound for a wound, a burn for a burn, a life for a life. I have one atheist friend. I, I told you before I have plenty of atheist friends. God somehow has put me in a ministry to that, but I had one I scared to death with this verse. I said, you only get what you deserve. That scared him more than the idea of him getting the same thing the devil gets, because he always depended on that, because it's not fair that I get what, the, what your devil gets. Well, you don't. Some will be beaten with many stripes and some will be beaten with few. Those who are beaten with many stripes are the ones who knew better and knew the will of the master. And the ones who get beaten with few are the ones who don't know the will of the master. Luke chapter 12. Um, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Now, notice that's the second time that appears, according to their deeds, verse 12, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake uh, of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. doesn't say they're tortured, but, um, and this is, some think this is just the spiritual aspect of it. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. They do get punished. And one of the debates, and we're going to come back to this one. Two nights from tonight. There is a debate. And I hate debates. It's interesting to contemplate, but I don't want to judge any man because he doesn't understand things the way I do. One of my good friends, Cliff Bailey, and I, we were talking yesterday about some of this, and we disagree on some of these things. But um, is there an end to some people's hell? Matthew chapter 5 talks about the process of judgment. And some people are in danger of going to the 
what in the Greek is called the Gehenna, the hell fire. But there's also a verse in that passage that says, and you'll not get out until you pay the last farthing. Does that imply some will eventually get out? And if they get out, where do they go? What do they do? You know, it's really one of those strange things Scripture isn't clear about. God hasn't given us exhaustive knowledge. I'll accept whatever he says. If he says they, st they get punished to world without end, amen, I'm willing to accept that. Or if he says, no, no, this guy gets 183 years of having to whatever. You know, I don't know. There's so many images of hell and punishment. I don't know what's literal and what's figurative. Yes, David. Yes. You see, there are two views on that. One view is we're going to make you go to hell for 183 years. I don't know why I like 183. Six liter, three liter engine. Okay. Um, 183 cubic inches. Mine works and strange. I, I studied originally to be an engineer. I wanted to build race cars. And so I know all these little things that sometimes just pop out and I'm embarrassed that I bring them up. But you get to go to hell for 183 years. One view is at the end of it, God says, okay, your, your punishment's paid. Goodbye. You go out of existence. Annihilation. Another view is that you get released to a lesser existence. I'll wait and see. But what? My, my point I always make is, whatever it is, it is fair. It is true justice. It's the white throne. It's, it fulfills every aspect of what you deserve, you personally. Um, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a wound for a wound. I'm almost done here. Um, forgive me, I've gone two minutes over. But... Um, yeah, that, that's one of the views. Some things, um, I love the verse in Deuteronomy that says, the secret things belong unto God, but what is revealed belong to us and to our children forever. We only know to the degree that Scripture says something. And sometimes... We have to deal with multiple scriptures. And they all have to agree in how you ultimately interpret them. And I'm not smart enough. I'm, I just tell you that I'm not smart enough. But I do believe this, that the great white throne is true justice, not some sadistic justice, but true justice. But the, the thing we're going to see in the next two weeks is that what God has offered to mankind is something marvelous. He offers us a way of escape, and uh, we're going to go through those two things. Okay, let me have a word of prayer. Thanks for th that. That is a great comment because there's a non. Uh, let me add. Uh, come on, uh, I've gone four minutes over. I won't go much. Uh, there's a non-instrumental Church of Christ guy named Fudge. And he held to a view like what you what described, okay? Limited in time for some. For the devil and his angels, it's really a long time. I can't imagine what the devil's going to get. Um, and intensity. It's not just time, it's intensity. Beaten with many stripes, beaten with few, that type of thing. Um, I'm not sure on some of these things. But what, what it makes me rejoice is there's the way of escape. And, what, and God has told us what we should do when we face these types of evil. I, 
I don't want to do this, but if it comes to this thing, I want to be able among those who stretch out my neck and let them behead me. I want to be among those who uh, they say, we are burn you with fire. I'll say, may God be merciful to me. May I go quickly. But um, it's, just, it's just, we in America haven't seen the full wrath of evil like some of these countries have. We haven't seen, but we may. And we need to be faithful to Christ. And we need to bless and not curse. We need to forgive. We need to uh, pray for the person. One of the things that drives the, the uh, persecutor crazy is when the Christians would pray for them that they would be delivered from this madness and that type of thing. So well, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you that you've allowed me to think about this and to present what I understand. Help me not to present false things, but help us, to Father, to present the things that are truly important. I thank you that Satan is a defeated being, that his forces are defeated, and that you will bring about the great defeat. Pray this uh, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, see you next two weeks. Uh, I have three weeks, actually. I, I was supposed to tell you this. I'm going to do the last night that I'm here this time, the book of Jonah. Uh, whatever his name is, Todd. <laughs> I guess that's his name. Uh, Todd asked me to do the book of Jonah. Not sure.